الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد المعترفين بنعمائه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا طاهرا دائما مباركا فيه ملء السماوات وملء الأرض وملء ما بينهما وملء ما شئت يا ربنا من شيء بعد أهل الثناء والمجد أحق ما قال العبد وكلنا لك عبد اللهم لا مانع لما أعطيت ولا معطي لما منعت ولا ينفع ذا الجد منك الجد اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة لنا إلا بك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Endless he is in his glory. I thank him for the blessings that he has granted me and my family and loved ones. I thank him for the blessings that he has privileged this community with. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every way and shape possible. And I express my gratitude with every ounce of my being. And I say alhamdulillah for the blessings that I know and experience and feel. And alhamdulillah for the blessings that I enjoy but forget. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the role model to be followed, the carrier of the torch of light. I thank Allah for the blessing that is Muhammad. And I ask Allah to make us among the followers of Muhammad and to give us the strength to walk in the footsteps of Muhammad and to brighten our faces on the day of judgment to the sight of Muhammad, Allahumma Ameen. I ask Allah to extend his blessings to the Prophet and his family and descendants, to his companions and followers, and all men and women that strive to walk steadily in their footsteps, and I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them, Allahumma Ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the ayat in the Quran, you know, that really shake me when I read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the process by which he eventually brought Adam and mankind to this earth. Allah says, وَقُلْنَا هَبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حين. Allah said to Adam and through Adam to all of humanity, descend or rather fall, drop go down, be reduced, come to this earth, descend to, to this earth, so that you will become foes to one another, so that you will become enemies for one another. And in this earth you will dwell and enjoy my blessings for an assigned period of time, after which I will basically take you all back. What uh, strikes me about the ayah is the designation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about human experience on this earth as that of uh, person and foe, as that of enemy versus enemy, uh, as that of someone who is going against the interests of someone else. That is Allah's definition of our journey on this earth, is that it is this constant struggle to overcome challenges, this constant struggle to overcome obstacles, this constant struggle to overcome difficulties, right? Uh, when you are blessed with a child, you think that the first two years of that child are the most difficult. Waking up in the middle of the night and changing diapers and feeding them and all that. But when your child is now running around the house, you realize that, oh man, this is a lot more difficult than the previous phase. And then you think, well, this is probably the most difficult phase of the child's life. And then when your kid starts going to school and need to be taught manners and math and science and Quran and how to pray and how to make wudu and how to stay away from haram and all that, you realize that this is the most difficult phase. 
And then you think to yourself, inshallah, once my kids are off to college and they get married and they become independent, now I'll be free. But you realize that things only get more difficult from there. Because that another phase of their lives comes with more and more challenges, right? And as a child, you also think that what you're going through right now is the most difficult phase. Once I pass through middle school and go to high school and be more independent, things are going to get better. And then you realize that it did not get better at all, right? In fact, it just got more difficult. And you say to yourself, you know what, it's fine. Once I go to college and enjoy adult life in college, things are going to get better right away. And then you go to college and you realize that it just only got more difficult. Once I graduate and I have my degree and I have my career and I get married and I start my family, things are going to get much easier, smooth sailing. And when you actually achieve that, you realize that it's just brought different, different types of difficulties upon you. And people who spend their lives trying to find a moment of peace and a moment of serenity and a moment of tranquility will always be disappointed. Because life, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it, is layers upon layers upon layers of difficulty. The sooner you accept that about your existence, the easier your journey is going to become. But if you keep muscling your way through the journey of life thinking that I need to achieve happiness, I need to achieve happiness, when will I be happy? When will I be? If you're not happy now, this very moment, despite all the difficulties, I guarantee it, you will never become happy. If you think that happiness will come at a future date, when you've achieved something in particular, I guarantee it. Once you achieve that thing, the list of difficulties and challenges will be like this high. The sooner you understand that about your journey, the easier things will become. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps feeding you this information in the Quran. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ What is kabad? Kabad is struggling, is difficulty. Right? Your life is difficult. That's just how it is. You're not on this earth to enjoy. What's the point of Jannah? You're not on this earth to have fun. Even though we do have fun occasionally. We do enjoy occasionally. But in our hearts we know that this is the grounds of testing. Earth is the ground of testing. Someone might say, well, Imam, why? You know, such a loving God would subject his creation to the difficulties of testing and trials. Why is it that God can just make everyone happy? And open all the doors and answer all the prayers and give us everything we want. He's capable. Why don't he just why doesn't he just do that? And the answer is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trains you in the journey of life like a, a, a marathon Olympic athlete who is about to run a 10,000 meter marathon. And they put you in this. Um, boot camp for one month in order to train your body, to train your mind, to train your muscles, in order to get into the regimen of competitiveness, right? So that when you go to the Olympics, you're able to compete, right? Now for that one month in the boot camp, you struggle a lot and you go through a lot of pain, you know, training like 18 hours a day, barely get any sleep. Your food is assigned to you by your coach. Everything, you're being told what to do. Lots of limitations. You can't do this, you can't do this. You have to do this, you must do that. But in your heart, you know. It's just one month, it's temporary, and I'm doing this so that I can compete because my eyes are on the prize. And in the uh, Olympic competition, the prize is the gold medal. Right? You get the gold medal, you're an Olympic gold medal winner for life. That's it. You know, they will mention your name, and after that, Olympic gold medal winner. It's attached to your name. People who go you know, to college for four difficult years and they spend the night studying and they go through excruciating exams. But then after that, they have a career and then they have a job and they have an income. Now it all makes sense. I got my, my prize. Alhamdulillah. People who refrain from doing things haram when they're teenagers, even though society keeps encouraging them to do those things because they're waiting to get married to be in a halal relationship. All the difficulties of self-restraint, all the difficulties of curbing our desires, and all of it, it, it'll make sense the minute you are with the one that you love, and you marry that person, and you start a family with them. That's your gold medal. 
This applies to everything in life and I don't understand why we don't make it apply to our journey as we go to Jannah. This life, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of existence is your boot camp, brothers and sisters. And the gold medal is Jannah. And you are an Olympic athlete that is preparing for the marathon. That's just how it is. It's as simple as that. And if you understand the journey of life in such terms, you know, things will not necessarily be less difficult, but you'll be able to cope. It is about developing coping mechanisms with the challenges and not the removal of challenges. Challenges are not going to go away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the strength to manage the challenges, to manage the trials and the tribulations. Now, here's the thing. If you're an Olympic athlete and you are in that one month boot camp and, you know, there's like treadmills and weights and you are in that gym like, you know, most of the day, your life is very difficult. But then your sponsor or your coach, you know, maybe Nike or, you know, some corporate company that sponsors you, right? Because you are very promising. So they spend the money in order to get you ready for competition, right? Now... They will also, in order to facilitate your journey, they will give you a lot of things. For example, they will give you exclusive use to the gym, state-of-the-art equipment. They will give you your meals every day, the you know, hand-picked, healthy, organic stuff that you will eat three, four. You know, you're an athlete, so you probably need to eat like five, six times a day, right? Uh, you know, the best water, like, you know, Evian. The, the most expensive water, the most expensive, uh, you know, vitamin uh, supplements, right? Uh, the most expensive coaches, the most expensive uh, mentors, right? As you go through the difficulties of training, you, you're also getting a lot of facilitation and a lot of perks and a lot of blessings in order to help you, right, with the one month boot camp. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the same exact thing. As marathon runners, all of us, you know, Olympic athletes in the journey of this life, keeping an eyes on the prize that is Jannah, the, the gold medal that every single one of us wants to win. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us in the boot camp of this dunya, the challenges and trials and tribulations and difficulties and suffering that we all go through. But in order to make the journey easier on you, he also facilitates the journey by giving you a lot of blessings. By giving you a lot of blessings, a lot of beautiful things. To make it easier on you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your sponsor. He wants to make sure that you end up in Jannah. So he subjects you to the boot camp and he wants you to train well so that you can run in the marathon. And he provides you with all the facilitation because he wants to see you in Jannah. That's what he wants eventually, right? So he gave you your senses, your eyes that you can see with and your ears and your nose and your ability to taste and your ability to enjoy beauty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you your intellect. So you can make decisions and decide what is right and what is wrong on your own. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you fitrah. Your inner compass that tells you what is moral and what is immoral in your heart deep inside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you legs to walk with and bike and get on the treadmill and do all this stuff. He gave you hands to do things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a great coach and mentor that is with you all the time, that keeps teaching you and providing you with guidance and insight, also known as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gave you a great training manual that you always refer back to and read from in order to decide which training exercise is better for the journey. And that training manual is also known as the Qur'an. This is the journey of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you through the difficulties of the boot camp but at the same time, he provides you with all the facilitations and the blessings needed so that you are successful in your journey. Now, if you're not successful, then it's on you. Then it's on you. Because you've been, you cannot say, well, you know, life was difficult. Yes, life is difficult for everyone. That's a given. And in order to compensate for the difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided you with a lot of other things. Now, it's up to you to utilize those things in order to make better decisions in this life so that you can win the gold medal that is Jannah at the end of the day. Now, there's one particular blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that is so important for this journey. And that blessing is the blessing of wealth. The money that we have, the earnings that we make, your salary, your income, your savings, your accounts, 
the money that we use to buy things every day, that is one of the greatest blessings of this life. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day for the wealth that we have. And we collectively as a community are doing much better than almost most Muslims that live in the world. Wouldn't you agree? If you live in this area, by definition, you're probably in the upper 5% in the world. And, and many of us don't even think about that. We don't remember that. We need to be reminded of that. The wealth that you have, the wealth that you enjoy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted you that wealth so that it facilitates the journey. It helps you as you progress in the training in your gym, in your training camp, right? And of course, if we keep going through the list, we will run out of, uh, out of blessings because Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُهَا You will run out of numbers before you try to count all the blessings of Allah. I, I can give you know, a series of khutbas for months and we will never cover the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. And that is why we always say, Alhamdulillah. Constantly say Alhamdulillah. Cast complaining aside. Don't become a complainer. Whatever happens to you, pick yourself up and you say Alhamdulillah. You get injured, say to yourself, well, my, the rest of my body is okay. Alhamdulillah. Always be in the business of, of saying Alhamdulillah and being positive because sometimes you remember the blessings, sometimes you don't remember them. But you got to say Alhamdulillah regardless, right? Now here's the kicker. Occasionally, the sponsor comes to you while you're, you know, training in the gym and he says to you, uh, hey, uh, by the way, can you give some water bottles to the guy in the gym next door? Another promising athlete, you know, he has a great potential, but he's in another gym because your sponsor cares about you so much, so he gives you your own exclusive gym. And the sponsor, you know, the other guy ran out of water bottles. So the sponsor comes to you and says, hey, can you just give some water bottles to the guy in the next gym? What is your response? No, nah, man. These are my water bottles. I'm not giving any water bottles to anyone. These are mine. So the sponsor is like, just remember, it's not yours. I mean, I, I gave you the water bottles. I gave you the gym. I gave you the, the Nike outfit that you're wearing. I gave you the, the, the five treadmills. I gave you all the weight racks. I gave you everything here. And I'm just asking you to share a couple of water bottles to the guy next door. And then you say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. What if I run out of water? What if I needed them? Well, don't worry. I am the one that gave you the bottles in the first place. When you run out, I'll give you more. Don't worry about it. And then you cling to the water bottles even more, right? So your sponsor, out of his grace and love, he comes, you know what? Don't worry about it. Give me the water bottles as a loan. Lend me the water bottles. Even though I gave you the water bottles in the first place, but I want you to lend them to me. And I, you have my word. I am the one that provided them in the first place, but you have my word. I will give you the water bottles back. No. I, I don't want to give up my water bottles. They're mine. How do I know you're going to give them back to me? Well, are you out of your mind? You didn't have them in the first place, and if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have the water bottles. But you cling more to the water bottles, and you have like stacks and stacks of other water bottles in the back, in the back of the gym, right? But you cling more to the water bottles, and you don't want to give them up. So the sponsor, out of his grace, he says, you know what? Give me one water bottle, and I'm going to give it back ten water bottles. Well, how do I know? SubhanAllah, what is wrong with this guy? Okay, give me one water bottle and I'll give it back 700 water bottles. And I will guarantee that you will never run out of water bottles for the rest of your life. And you still cling to the water bottle and you refuse to give it. Do you understand now the dilemma of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Lord is your sponsor in this world. He put you in the boot camp of difficulty, that gym of this dunya. And he put you through the difficulty of having to train for the marathon in order to win the gold medal. But he also facilitated your journey by providing you with literally everything you have, including water bottles. And he occasionally comes to you and he seeks you to give charity to support others. A cause be in fact, Allah says your wealth is yours exclusively. 99% of the time, use it, uh, spend it on yourself, on your children, buy the thing that you love. That's why I gave it to you. But occasionally, once in a while, the sponsor asks you to take a little bit of that wealth and give it to somebody else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his love and grace and dignity, he doesn't want to rub it in your nose and says, hey, it's mine. 
give it back. He says, can you give it to me as a loan? And I will give it back to you multiplied by 700. And even then we still say no. Even then we still say no. Like in, in the real world, it won't make any sense. If, you're deal if Nike is asking you to give water bottles, you will. Because you know that they will give you more. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that you pray for, that you came to this masjid today in order to serve, his words don't carry the same weight that a sports company carry. Do you understand how complex this is in, in terms of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, the idea of sadaqah. Why? Because this is the year of beauty. We said that to 2019, Amul Jamal, this is the year of beauty. We want to talk about things that make us beautiful. Beautiful in, in the way we look, in the way we dress, in the way we smell, beautiful in the way we speak, in the way we behave with each other, in the way we interact, in the way we respond and react. Beautiful on the outside and beautiful on the inside. That's what we're trying to achieve this year, to create that beauty in our community, to make it a concept that is important and necessary, right? And as the month of Ramadan approaches, I said that there are obstacles that prevent us from absorbing the beauty of Ramadan. And last uh, Friday, I spoke about your five daily prayers as, as a prerequisite in order to help you absorb what is beautiful about the month of Ramadan. If you make a promise today that, inshallah, I will start praying regularly, right? Even though I am, you know, 10 and, you know, I, I did not reach puberty yet, and I'm not obligated to pray, well, whatever you get used to today, you will likely keep doing as you grow older. But if you just wait until that miraculous moment when you're 16, and suddenly wake up in the morning, and you start praying regularly, hey, it may or may not happen. But if you start from now, and you, and you keep doing it on a regular basis, well, maybe it'll become a habit in your life. And this is particularly important as Ramadan approaches because people who don't pray, their hearts are not in the right place and they're not able to take in what Ramadan has to offer them, right? And the same applies to Sadaqah, brothers and sisters. You know, the, the twin brother of Salah, almost every time Salah is mentioned in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Zakah, charity. Every, almost every time in the Quran. Like they are, they go hand in hand, constantly. يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ constantly in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those two things. Because salah is about you serving the creator and zakah is about you serving the creation. The, the vertical relationship with the, with the Lord and the horizontal relationship that we have with each other. This is how the concept of the ummah is created and built, right? And so I wanted to talk to you today, you know, again, remind you as Ramadan approaches, this is the month of charity, it's a month of giving, it's a month of generosity, it's the month of sadaqah and zakah. People always wait to give their zakah in the month of Ramadan. And I, I wish that our community treats their zakah with the same uh, uh, importance and the same seriousness by which they treat their salah. Because zakah is also a fard that many of us ignore. Like, we don't lump sum our prayers at the end of the day and just, you know, pray like 17 rak'ahs and that's it and say we call it a day. We don't do that. But a lot of people, when they give their charity, they say, well, you know, I, I donated like $5,000, you know, this year. Well, I'm pretty sure that my zakah is in there somewhere. If we don't do that with our salah, why are we doing this with our zakah? So we have to calculate our zakah and give it with, with the niyyah of giving zakah in the month of Ramadan. But then we also give a lot more than just zakah because sadaqah is this all-encompassing concept of charity that you know, involves zakah and other things as well, right? Let me share with you a beautiful story. Imam Amr al-Shabi tells this story about a, a, a married couple that were basically sitting at their house having dinner. And then someone came and knocked on the door. So the lady, the, the wife, goes to the door, she opens the door. And there was this uh, poor person, this beggar, who was asking for food. He said, I'm so hungry, feed me please, give me some food, right? So Imam Amr al-Shabi says that she came back to her husband and she said, you know, let's give him like a piece of chicken or something from our table. And her husband categorically refused. He said, we're not going to give him anything. So the lady went and she was very upset, she was very apologetic and she said to the guy, I'm so sorry, I can't give you anything, my, my husband wouldn't let me. And then she came back. 
A few years later, her husband had financial difficulties and ended up divorcing her because he said, I can't support you anymore. You know, which is kind of predictable based on his behavior. The lady was heartbroken when she left her husband and then she struggled, you know, on her own for a while until she got married. She married this really nice guy, this noble guy, and, you know, she was very, very happy with him. And Imam Amr al-Shabi says that one of those days, years and years later, she was eating dinner with her husband at home, her, her second husband. And then someone comes knocking on the door. So she goes to uh, open the door, and when she opened the door, she found a beggar who was asking for food. Now that's a very visceral moment for that, wife, for that woman. Why? Because this is how she gauges her husband's heart. And she had a, a bad experience with a similar moment years ago with her first husband, right? So she was so hesitant. She came to her husband and, and, and she you know, wanted to tell him, hey, there's a beggar at the door and we need to give him something. Without even saying a word, her husband took the entire tray of food and gave it to her with a big smile on his face. Give him everything. We have enough, alhamdulillah. Give him the water bottle. So she took the tray and she followed her husband, uh, followed the, the other, uh, the, guy, the beggar that was standing outside in order to give him the food. And then she came back to her husband with tears and tears and tears falling on her, on her cheeks. And she told him, you're not going to believe this. That beggar was actually my first husband. I didn't recognize him because he got so old and, and he's so hairy and beard and he looks so dirty. I didn't recognize him initially. But look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done to him. I'm so upset. And I'm so frightened for him and what is happening to him. And that's when her husband, Imam Amr al-Shabi says, that's when her husband hugged her. And he said, I was not going to tell you about this forever, but since this happened, since that guy, that second beggar, is your first husband, I just wanted to let you know that I am the first beggar that came at your house and, they, and you denied me, your husband denied me food. And here I am today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. You know, this is how Allah elevates and reduces people, right? based on how generous you are and how charitable your heart is. We say this to adults, you know, give, give, give. But we also say this to children when you share. You know, my, my father taught me something and a lot of people in my generation, they know this very well. You can never eat without having someone sharing your food. You can never eat. You know, my dad was like this. He, even if we've already had dinner and he comes home, he had to have someone w w sit with him to just take a couple of bites. Because you got to share your food. And if, if he couldn't find any of us in the house, he would take some food in a plate and he would give it to one of the neighbors. But he would never, ever, ever eat by himself. He would only find joy if he's able to share his food and share his wealth and share his blessings with other people. And, you know, the idea is that this is what I'm talking to you about today, is that your, your charity, your generous nature elevates you. It gives you this sublime understanding of the world. It gets you to overcome the petty disagreements and difficulties between people. It keeps your heart focused on the gold medal, the prize that you're after. It gives you an understanding that all of the things in this dunya are a mere blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I give back, I am only saying thank you to Allah that has provided me with this in the first place. A few years ago, uh, a sister who, are, who was a single mom, she was raising four kids. And I know her well because she converted to Islam, you know, in my office so many years ago at Salam. She was blessed with children. And then her husband left her, literally just disappeared. Until to this day, we don't know where he is. So this lady had to grieve for the disappearance of her husband and she had to raise four kids on her own, right? And then her kids got in, uh, with some issues at their Sunday school in one of the local masajid. You know, the masjid that, that she lived very close to. And, you know, because of her ethnic background, her kids were not treated well. She had a lot of disagreements with Sunday school management and the quality of the curriculum and the quality of the teacher and all of these things. To the extent that one of the teachers actually bullied her son because of her, because of her son's race. And, and it was really like going out of control. So they asked me to help. 
So I interfered and I brought everyone to the table and we spoke and alhamdulillah it was, it was over. And then six months later I was invited to the fundraising banquet of that same masjid. And I'm just sitting there, you know, looking around and I see that sister and her four kids sitting on one of the tables at the banquet of the masjid that she had problems with. Like I asked myself, if I'm in her place, would I behave the same way? Probably I would have given to my anger and, and just dismissed the masjid and its leadership and just walked away. Right? Because we're weak that way as human beings. But that sister just sat at the event and she contributed. And wallahi, brothers and sisters, this is a woman that juggles three jobs on minimum wage in order to support her children. So after the event, I took her to the side and I was just so fascinated with her character and her strength. And I told her, MashaAllah, I mean, what are you doing here? I, I thought that you would never even pray at this masjid before because of what happened to your kids, right? She said, well, it's the closest masjid to my house and, and you know, and to one of my jobs and I, I, I pray there. My kids are still going to Sunday school. So I said, MashaAllah, in my heart, you know, I wanted, I wanted to say, well, you know, this sister probably deserves zakah herself. She deserves zakah. And she raised her hand at that event and she made a pledge. And I was really fascinated by that. So I told her, you know, I, why did you still support them financially? And she said, I come to this masjid to pray every Friday. And my kids go to Sunday school. This is my masjid. Someone pays for the bills. Someone pays for the janitorial service. I cannot allow somebody else to pay for the services that I use. It's a matter of honor for me. It would be dishonorable for me to go and to utilize the services of the masjid knowing that someone else is paying for it and I'm just going to be okay with that. That was like six or seven years ago and to this day I still remember that story. When you're focused on what is important and what is sublime, you're not worried about these petty issues and petty details. You start treating the world differently. You rise above the challenges. And you invest in, in your Muslim community. And you invest in the future of the ummah. And the day-to-day -day petty issues are not a problem anymore. That's one of the lessons I learned from that great sister. And I look at our community and alhamdulillah, I see us making a tremendous progress. And we've grown so much. And, you know, I've been in this area for 15 years. And I've worked with all types of groups. And wallahi, brother and sister, and I don't say this because we know each other very well. This group right here, this community, is one of the best in Northern California. And I'm not patting you on the back, but this is the reality. And, and as we need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I need to thank you as well for being at the forefront, for being leaders, and for inspiring the rest of this area. You know, everyone talks about this community and talks about what this community has achieved. And they talk about your character and your open-mindedness and your welcoming nature and your hospitality and your generosity. People are talking about us. But the work is cut out for us, brothers and sisters. There's so much that needs to be done. And we need to rise to the occasion. And we need to cast our disagreements aside and focus on the gold medal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds, forgive our sins, and establish us firmly on his path. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah from the heart. أدعو الله وأنتم موقنون بالإجابة إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميامين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين uh, My dear brothers and sisters uh, just a few days before Ramadan starts uh, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who reach Ramadan and those who will enjoy this beautiful blessed month and those who will be forgiven and those whose hearts will be inspired uh, in the month of Ramadan and I said that your salah your five daily prayers and your sadaqah your charity including your zakah will be two instruments that you can use in order to prepare your heart for the month of Ramadan. This is basically the gist of today's khutbah. And I wanted to share with you just, you know, as we conclude the khutbah, just some guidance from the Quran and the Sunnah as to why this is so important. Number one, your sadaqah elevates your status before Allah and before His creation as well. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, taught us through the words of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that 
uh, the best of people are those who benefit others. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The best of people are those who benefit others. Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, it's reported that he has said, إِنَّ الْأَعْمَالَ لَتَتَبَاهَا Good deeds boast with each other on the Day of Judgment. فَتَقُولُ الصَّدَقَةُ أَنَا أَفْضَلُكُمْ And Sadaqah will say, I am the best amongst you. Sadaqa boasts about its status in the sight of, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. Number two, as you rise and ascend in status, you will dodge a lot of harm that was coming your way. The Prophet taught us in the hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as-sadaqatu tasuddu sab'ina baban min as su Your charity seals shut more than 70 doors of harm that were coming your way. Harm comes in the form of an accident, in the form of uh, you know, a traffic stop in the form of losing money on the business, in the form of getting an F you know, in an exam, in the form of having a bad relationship, in the form of, a, of an illness or you know, cancer, God knows what. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and preserve us. There's always something out there that is coming your way. And the hadith tells you that with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you are constantly in the business of giving, all, many at least of these difficulties and these trials will be averted. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly say, says, Dawu Heal those who are sick amongst you by giving more charity. Abdullah ibn Mubarak once went and visited a, a, a very ill man who had this uh, you know, terrible gangrene. And he went to visit him and he said, you know, what is going on with you? He said, I, I've spoken with every doctor. I went to every hospital and no one can cure me. So what does Abdul, Abdullah ibn Mubarak say? He said to him, dig a well. And as the water rises in the well to benefit the people, mark my words, the illness in your leg will subside. And that is exactly and precisely what happened in a widely cited story in the tradition. So it heals the ill and, and, and the disease in your family. If you have a family member that is struggling with an illness, give. We keep making dua and going to the imam and going to the doctors and spending tens of thousands of dollars on health care. Give charity. Remember what the Prophet says to you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number four, sadaqa is like water that puts out the fire of the Lord's wrath. When Allah is angry with you because of sins that you've committed, not just make dua and make tawbah, give sadaqah as well. Inna sadaqah tutfi'u ghadab al-rabb kama tutfi'u al-ma'u al-nar. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the wrath of the Lord. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that sadaqah is a proof of your iman. Because all other acts of worship are free. Salah doesn't cost you anything. Fasting doesn't cost you anything. In fact, you know, you eat only one meal or a meal and a half a day, right? Uh, uh, shahada doesn't cost you anything, right? Hajj is only required once in a lifetime for those who can afford it. But sadaqa is the only reflection of how strong your iman is because it comes with a cost. And that's why the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as-sadaqatu burhan. Sadaqa or charity is proof. Proof of what? Proof of how strong your iman is. Right? Last but not least, the Quran says, You cannot achieve tremendous success in this world unless you spend from that which you love the most. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was once riding a camel and he loved the camel so much, strong, powerful, young. And he said to himself, this is a camel that I need to give in, cha in charity. <coughs> when you love it so much, then that is the one thing that deserves to be given in charity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُصَّدِّقِينَ وَالْمُصَّدِّقَاتِ وَأَقْرَضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا يُضَاعَفُ لَهُمْ وَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ كَرِيمٌ Those who give charity and lend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a beautiful loan, their wealth will increase. We all know that. We all know that. And I wanted to end it with this story for, for your amusement, a story that uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari narrated. He's on his deathbed, and his sons and daughters are around him. And then he goes into a coma, and comes out of a coma, and he says, 
remember the companion, the man of the loaf of bread. And then he goes back into a coma. And then his children wait. He comes out of his coma. Remember the, the, the man of the, of the loaf of bread. And then he goes back to his coma. And one time he came out of the coma and one of his sons, Father, tell us the story of the man of the loaf of bread. What is the deal with this guy? So he says this man, his name is Juraj. He was this worshiper of Bani Israel. Who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for decades and decades and decades as a monk in his monastery. And one of those days he was enticed by a woman. And he lived with that woman and he was not married to her. He lived with her for one week in a haram relationship. And after the one week was over, he was so upset and remorseful of what he did. And, and he was so broken up about it. And he said to himself, I spent a lifetime worshipping Allah and then I lose myself for just a few days. So he's literally wandering off the streets. He doesn't know where to go. And as Abu Musa describes him, for every step he makes, he falls in sujood. And then he gets up. Makes, takes one step, falls in sujood, and then gets up. Constantly doing this in order to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He arrives at this uh, old shack and it was raining. And there was 12 poor destitute people sitting in the shack seeking refuge from all the bad rain. So now he joins them, it becomes 13 people. And there's this other monk who brings a basket of bread every night to feed them. So he has 12 loaves of bread. And he distributes, the, he gave him the basket, and he says, hey, here's the basket of bread, you know, you guys distribute the bread amongst you. So, 12 of them got bread, including Juraj himself, who was not from the group, but he just joined them. And so one person raised his hand, and he said, I, I don't have my loaf. So the man said, no, I gave you guys 12, and there's 12 of you, one of you took two loaves of bread, probably. So you figure it out. And the man said, well, alhamdulillah, I'm just going to sleep hungry then. And Juraj said to himself, I cannot go to sleep with my belly full. And this poor person, his, his belly is empty and he sleeps hungry. So he gave him the loaf of bread. And as Abu Musa describes, فَمَاتَ مِنْ لَيْلَتِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused him to die that night. فَتَنَازَعَتْ فِيهِ مَلَائِكَةُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَمَلَائِكَةُ الْعَذَابِ the angels of blessings and, and reward and the angels of punishment. They came and had a dispute about who takes him, who takes his soul. The angels of punishment said, you know, this person committed zina and, and he lived with a woman that is not his wife for over a week. That is that's good enough for us. He's going to hell. And the angels of rahmah, of mercy, they said, come on guys. He lived a life of, of righteousness and worship. He shouldn't lose all of that because of one sin he committed. So another angel came to them and he basically said to them, let us weigh acts of worship of 70 years on a scale against seven days of sin in order to figure it out. So they did this and they realized that which side was heavier? The seven days of sin was heavier because he did it deliberately after knowing what is right. After spending a lifetime with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chose differently. He's not some young person who gave in to his you know, temptation and, and gave in to the weakness of his desires. No, this is an elderly person. You should know better. So seven days of zina weighed against a lifetime of worship and it was heavier, subhanAllah. And then the angel told him, now weigh the loaf of bread that he gave to this person against seven days of haram. And the sadaqah of the loaf of bread was heavier than the seven days. And the angels of mercy are the ones that took him and he was forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he went to Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our eyes fixated on the prize. I ask Allah to grant us al-firdaus al-a'la, the highest level of Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect and preserve our children, our sons and daughters, our spouses, our siblings, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and those uh, upon us, their favors uh, are so much. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us grateful for those favors. I ask Allah to protect our masajid and institutions to strengthen the Muslim community so that it grows and expands. I ask Allah to help us unlock hearts and open minds with our love and compassion 
and with the strength of our character and the clarity of our identity. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us closer as brothers and sisters of the same community. And as He gathered us here, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the most beautiful month of Ramadan and to gather all of us in the highest level of Jannah. اللهم آمين اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا تقبل منا يا ربنا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم بلغنا رمضان واغفر لنا فيه واجعلنا فيه من عتقائك من النار واجعلنا فيه من المقبولين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا